Four years ago, a book was published that laid bare the very roots of Western civilization. It argued that the cradle of Europe, ancient Greece, had origins in Africa and the East, and that the West should recognize what it owed to black and Eastern cultures. This spring, a second volume is being published. The book is Black Athena. On the surface, the difference between gigantic Egyptian monuments and the human scale of Greek buildings gives every appearance of totally different cultures. But Bernal argues that our image of the Greeks has been built up from only part of their legacy. I think that uh, Greek religion had a lot more uh, mystery and uh, animals and things like that mixed up in it than our view of the purely human Olympians who are in a vague way associated with Greek rationality. But I mean, Greek rationality was there, but it was a very small proportion. If one looks at the number of Greek texts or Greek things, most of it is dealing with uh, religious superstitious things which have nothing to do with rationality uh, in, in that sense. Um, so that Greek culture is a, an eclectic culture adapted to fit the Greek environment, but that Egypt was an extraordinarily important element in that mix, and it has been systematically downplayed for the last 150 years. In order to uh, understand what happened in Greece in terms of this unusual rise and unusual development, which happened so rapidly, it appears to be unique and appears to be a miracle. But there's no miracle. The miracle was the relationship of Greece to Africa. But we have to go beyond Brunel. See, whiteness limitates you. <coughs> It limits you even when you get into something serious like this. And let's deal with that. Bernal tapped into African understanding and knowledge, the Southern Cradle understanding knowledge, and so he was able to break out of his mold of European ethnocentrism. But the value system of the rightness of whiteness still impacts upon him. So he cannot make a clear statement that the Africans of the Nile were African. He's still holding on to that maybe they was kind of brown and mixed. You see, and when you get into that mixture, mixed with what? If you mix anything with African, you're in trouble. You see, because African genes are dominant genes. European genes are recessive genes. So any mixture is going to move toward Africa. You have these students looking at the Egyptians and assuming that these Egy the Egyptians were black, and then taking that thesis one step further and saying, since the Egyptians were black and the Egyptians were the progenitors of Greek civilization, so our, in our ancestors, blacks, were the progenitors of Western civilization. Um, and so this becomes a very kind of useful model of history to reinforce black pride, uh, to resupply to the black student the missing past. And then you got other pharaoh, other images. Here's brother Keper, Keper Ka Ra, Senhewaset I, again of the 12th dynasty of the Middle Kingdom, obviously looking like my brother. But here's my main man. He's got big African feet. Mentuhotep II. Now, he was on the throne 2000 uh, BC. While he was on the throne, the Greeks didn't have a pot to pee in. The ancient Hebrews weren't anywhere around or as significant. The Romans hadn't, the wolves hadn't come up to nurture Romulus and Remus. Europeans wasn't doing a damn thing. And this brother was sitting on the throne. 
And I guess he decided, you know, just for, for kicks, he won himself pictured as black. I would just like to draw the attention of people that black in statuary in ancient Egypt doesn't mean black skin. It means fertile, alive, as opposed to reddish or yellowish, which is the color of the desert and the lack of fertility. So whenever you see a statue being painted black, it means that it is a hope for revival, that it is alive, not at all that it is black skinned. I think the ancient Egyptians would have had uh, a fair amount of amusement out of the, uh, this debate as to whether the, they were black or whether they were white. The ancient Egyptians were more concerned with nationalism, with who was Egyptian and who was not Egyptian. Uh, the ancient Egyptian texts uh, are very clear about what they thought of foreigners. They spoke of the Asiatics as being vile. Uh, throughout their texts, we read about the vile Asiatic. And we also read uh, their opinion about the Nubians, whom they call vile also. In the Cairo Museum, models of Nubian soldiers are painted black, in contrast to models of Egyptians who are colored a reddish brown. I don't think that the ancient Egyptians uh, were any different than what we are. The only thing I can tell you for a fact is that they differentiated themselves from black Africa, uh, from Negroid Africa, and because in their reliefs and in the terminology, in the names and everything, they show ethnies. The Egyptian looks completely different from what is an African in the Egyptian mind. This is the only thing I can tell you. And I suppose that you can draw your own conclusions from this remark. I don't believe that race is a very useful concept, as I say in my book. Nevertheless, I think bringing out the African uh, nature of Egyptian uh, civilization is important for our politics today. And a num this argument that I shouldn't be feeding the black racists, I don't like racism of any sort, I don't like black racism, I'm, I'm in my, uh, I believe in the cultural creativity of mixture and of, uh, of uh, but I'm much less frightened of giving ammunition to black racists than I think orthodox classicists should be of giving ammunition to white racists because I think white racism is a far more present and acute danger to our society today than black racism. And I part company with Martin Bernal on the issue of white racism is bad, black racism is tolerable because after all blacks have suffered so much from white racism and historically, whites have not suffered in any proportion of the uh, way blacks have. Racism in any form is uh, counterproductive. Um, it's also disgusting. Um, and um, I think that it's all, I say counterproductive because it's counterproductive for the black students themselves. Because what they should be getting at is an accurate and clear picture of the past. They should correct the distortions in history, but without creating a whole new distorted model. Because in the end, if their own picture of their own past is built on distortions and, and, and lies, it does them no good. It'll crumple apart at the first opposition. So I'm saying we've got to begin to deal with the reality, and we can't expect the Bernals to do it. They've done their job by taking us to a certain level. We have to go beyond it. I mean, the search for roots and origins is essentially uh, an affirmation of identity, uh, ethnic identity, religious identity, tra historical identity, national identity. And that is almost always a construction. There is no such thing as a pure Greek or a pure Egyptian or a pure anything. Everything is hopelessly mixed up together. And I, I don't see why they couldn't remain mixed up together. I mean, it seems to me that's the reality of the, new, of the world of the 90s.
Should we be actually concerned about who the Greeks were by blood, or should we be asking about how they constructed their own past? I actually think to even ask the question, who were the Greeks really, were they black, were they Jewish, is to fall into a racist trap. What we've got to do is abandon altogether these myths of ethnicity, myths of ethnic origin, and uh, we have to abandon both the myth of the Aryan origin and the myth, which he's trying to replace the Aryan model with, of the Egyptian Semitic origins of the Greeks and ask why their ideology works how it does, what are these myths actually saying. Whether or not his work is welcome to all classicists, Bernal intends to continue his project. The second volume of Black Athena is due out in the spring, and there are two more to follow. He firmly believes the Aryan model will crumble, but he has many academics yet to be convinced with his evidence. There are lots of very interesting new ideas and approaches in classical studies about the place now. Some are motivated partly politically, partly by other current interests in racism, feminism, whatever it might be. They all make their contribution. They're all, most of them at any rate, a good deal less hot-headed than they might have been a generation or so ago. And um, they all help. But if we say to ourselves, yes, of course, we realize that each generation takes its own view of the past, or each faction in each generation will take its own view, uh, the honest scholar ought to be able to make some sort of allowance for that. And one hopes that the, the common view which, which emerges will take allowance for that, and one can recognize, as one does, that is a feminist work, that is an anti-racist work, this is a structuralist work, this is a Marxist work, and so forth, and make due allowance. And that the single-minded who write these sort of things are making, are making their points, no doubt, but they're not making such a major contribution to our proper understanding as they may imagine. Well, I think that the accusation has often been leveled at me, and I'm sure it's been thought by many other people, that if I accuse other scholars of being influenced by their times and by their social backgrounds, I myself must be equally influenced by them. Um, and I think that there's some truth in this accusation, but my defense against it would be that my version is closer to the traditional version held for the last 1800 years or more, the last 2000 years, and I think that the Aryan model is more of an aberration than mine.